This happened to me back when I was 19. I'll be the first to acknowledge that I was stupid and naive for all of this. I was also very lucky to have my best friend with me, who obviously was much smarter. I had this friend at the time who was much older. I would guess he was about 35 or 36. For whatever reason, he liked to hang out with teens and people in their early 20s. I had met him through friends. He was a popular guy. Many of my friends were in bands and we generally were attending gigs together. And this guy was known to know a lot about punk rock, local bands, people you should know as an aspiring musician, as well as old cult status bands and their members. He had his own apartment, which isn't something many people in their 20s have in my country, so it was very cool to be able to hang out at his. He was a semi-professional sportsman. He had a vast collection of music and always had tons of food and weed on hand. He kind of liked me, or so I thought. We would exchange flirty texts on a daily basis, and it was great. I kind of liked him too. He was a good looking guy, but I always felt like something was just a little wrong whenever he started to get flirty or whatever. All was right when we were just texting, but in person, it felt weird. He just didn't sit right with me. I didn't know why at the time. Couldn't pinpoint that feeling to anything about him in particular. I was at his apartment often with my friends, but I'd never stay alone. Often I went there thinking, okay, this is it. Let's have some fun. With my girlfriends all excited for me too, but I would change my mind as soon as he opened the door. One day, my best friend visited me. She normally lives in another country, and she isn't from my city or area at all. She's actually only been here a few times to visit me. That's something that'll be important for later. Also note that we are both what you could call petite. She knew all about this guy and how I kind of liked him. So, of course, as soon as she came, the two of us went to visit the guy. We were alone at his apartment, and they seemed to get along well, so I was both calm and happy. He even made us some pasta, and we had some wine. At the table, my best friend said that she would skip the wine, which seemed a little strange, although I didn't ask why. We had a nice afternoon when he suddenly asked if we wanted to go to a party with him. He was going soon, and we could go with him. Of course, I said sure didn't even ask where to and with whom. I just figured we were going somewhere in the city and that I would likely see many people that I knew there. I was really popular back then and had many, many friends in my mid-sized hometown, so I had no worries at all. That's when two of his friends, both around his age, came over to pick us up. But as soon as we left his apartment complex, I realized that we were going in the wrong direction. Leaving the city, behind us. Only then did I ask where we were going, and they explained that their other friend had a farm far away on the outskirts of the town. I had a vague idea where that was, and I still wasn't nervous at this point, as I still figured that since it was supposed to be quite a big gathering, surely there would be people there that I knew. We arrived, and the farm was huge, with many greenhouses, trailer where the guy lived, and an old farmhouse which was apparently where his parents lived. In some of the greenhouses, there was weed growing in between rows of tomatoes. Apparently, this guy was the supplier that my friend always had his green from. There weren't that many other people there, and almost exclusively guys. The only other girls there were much older than us. Hippies, very stoned, chilling with their own boyfriends. We were definitely the youngest ones there. This started to make me feel anxious, but the overall vibe was good and pretty chill. The guys who were talking to us, despite the obvious age difference, were all very nice. No stupid innuendos or anything of the sort. So when my guy friend offered me a beer, I took it without thinking much about it. My best friend was offered drinks too throughout the night, but she politely passed on them each time. We sat around the fire and this is when things began to get blurry for me. In fact, the next thing I remember is laying in my bed the next morning with a profuse hangover. In fact, I couldn't remember a single thing from the night before. 
so the rest of the story is based on what my best friend told me. As I had my beer, just the one, in addition to the little bit of wine consumed hours before that, way less than what would normally get me drunk, I started to act wild. My best friend used the word slutty. I apparently began kissing the guy that I knew, hard, in front of everybody else near the fire. She was more than a little bit shocked, but thought that I wanted it. Then I sat on top of him, kissing and practically riding him then and there. That's when his friend came over and asked if he could get a kiss too. I willingly complied. This is when my friend began to worry about me, as this wasn't how I behaved at all. She noticed the guy wink at her, and then he exchanged smiles and winks with his other friends. All the while, another person tried to make my best friend drink something too, but they insisted that they had water or juice for her. Luckily, she didn't take it. That's when the guy that I knew asked the one living on the farm if he could use some of the privacy of the greenhouses before lifting me up and beginning to walk that way. Right at that moment, my brave little best friend stood up, protested that. She started yelling for him to leave me alone and said that we were leaving now. Some of the other people around, who up until that point were minding their own business, started noticing that something was going on, so this guy let me go. My best friend said that our taxi was waiting for us, and we promptly left the gathering. There was no taxi there. It was midnight at this point, and we were all alone on some rural road. No one from the party followed us though, so that was good. But my friend was scared the whole time. She walked, dragging me behind her to see the sign closest to the property, and was able to read the name of the place, as she had no idea where we were, and she was too afraid to ask any of the people at the party. That's when she called a cab, and waited with me for a half hour until it arrived. She had no idea what my parents' address was, so she had to navigate the taxi through my city as the cabbie drove. My house is right on the main street and has a distinctive mural on one side, so she was able to spot it. She found the keys in my purse and got me to the safety of my bed. If it wasn't for her, I shudder to think what would have happened to me on that farm. And as I dive deeper into that thought, I feel in my gut that it wouldn't have been just this one dude only. She said she was vigilant due to what I told her about the guy before she even came to visit. The fact that I liked him, but something wasn't right. That's why she didn't drink anything the whole afternoon and evening. She's literally the best. And like I said earlier, definitely the smarter one of the two of us. I encourage everyone to please be smarter than I was back then. Never go places alone with people you hardly know and don't trust. Always let somebody back home know what you're doing. Drop a GPS pin once you land yourself in a similar situation. Don't drink any alcohol or consume anything that somebody else gives you unless you know them very well or watch them pour it yourself. Most importantly, don't be afraid to call your parents for help. I'm upset at myself for putting my best friend through what I did knowing that I could have just called my parents to come get us. Listen to your gut. Mine was telling me that there was something wrong with that guy the whole time. I just didn't listen or expect it to be that bad. I honestly just thought I was creeped out because of the age difference. I was never the type to look for older guys on purpose. He had never forced me to do anything when we were at his apartment. Never made any lewd comments. Nothing. He seemed very adult and considerate, even compared to friends my own age. It feels good to get this off my chest. The only other person I ever talked to about it is my best friend. But if sharing this story saves one other girl from making the same mistakes that I did, well, the embarrassment I feel about sharing my own situation will definitely be worth it. My story takes place around 2004. I decided I'd had enough of the bitter cold Rocky Mountain winters. I'd spent most of my time since I was around 16 listening almost exclusively to Jimmy Buffett music, except for small breaks to listen to things like Journey's Greatest Hits. Jimmy 
was pretty much my entire musical life. I would listen to him talk about these far off places and these great adventures and weird characters that he'd come across. I read his books, which talked about pretty much the same things. I read interviews where, you guessed it, he talked about all the same things. So my young 22 year old brain was filled with these ideas that adventure was out there waiting for me, that all I had to do was go out and find it. Why was I rotting away in a frozen hell when there was so much more to see in more tropical climates? And it was this thinking that led me to pack everything I owned and stick my thumb out on the interstate. I was headed for Mobile, Alabama, which is Jimmy's hometown. Then I'd be off for Florida, where most of his songs are based. Then, well, the possibilities seemed endless from there. Maybe I'd find work on a boat in exchange for passage to some tropical place like Jamaica. You can go ahead and laugh at me. It's been around 20 years, so wisdom and life experience has allowed me to see clearly just how stupid I was for all of this. I can take the ribbing, but more on that later. My journey took me through Texas and Arkansas. There were many funny stories along this journey. However, those fun stories are not the focus here because there was nothing sinister about them. Along the way, my journey took me down to South Louisiana and Interstate 10. When you head down that section of highway between Lafayette and Baton Rouge, you have to pass over the Atchafalaya Basin, which means crossing over 18 miles of swampland via bridge. According to various sources, this bridge is the third longest in the US and the 14th longest in the world. That's a lot of bridge. And the shoulder of the road? Virtually non-existent. From what I've been told, police are quick to nab anyone foolish enough to try crossing the bridge on foot. So I was stuck, for hours, on the Lafayette side of the bridge, doing my best to thumb a ride across. Eventually, I was successful, and this is where things start to take an unsettling turn. A white van pulled up. When the door opens, there was no one in the vehicle but a single old man. He looked to be in his late 60s, maybe early 70s, quite obese, and wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. I climbed in and thanked him for stopping. As we took off, When the Sun Goes Down by Kenny Chesney and Uncle Cracker was playing on the radio. Due to the events that followed, I have forever lost any liking that I held for that song. We were headed across this massive bridge with nowhere to stop and nowhere for me to go. That's when the man started looking at me like a dog might look at a particularly meaty bone. He was making me uneasy already. Hey boy, he said in a thick Cajun accent. You got a big dick. Excuse me? I asked. I stared back at him, then out the window of the moving vehicle, realizing there was no escape route. I'll bet it's pretty big, he said, smiling at me. I really don't want to discuss this with you, I said. Nothing but guardrail on the right and swampland below that. Jumping out here would surely be deadly. I'd sure like to see it. He said. No, I don't think so, I replied. What I was thinking was, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which one fills up first. But undeterred, the man went on. I'd sure like to take you to the swamp. Oh hell, if I'd once thought, and I can't remember if I actually did, that the situation couldn't get worse, I would have been so so incredibly mistaken. No, I don't think so, I repeated. Oh, come on, boy, he insisted. It'll only take about half an hour. Please understand that I'm making his English clearer for those listening. But it was thick Cajun, as I've said before. So mixed with his drawl and the context of what he was saying, it made it way, way creepier. At this point, the man had asked to see my genitals and expressed his desire to take me deep into the swamps. I couldn't help but wonder if he was even going to give me a choice, or if he was just going to take me there by force. If he did, I'd be virtually helpless. I wasn't from there. I didn't know the area. 
I certainly didn't know the layout of the swamps. I would have been at his mercy for him to do with me as he pleased. And whatever it was that he pleased took a lot of forms in my mind. Would he take me somewhere and assault me and then feed me to the alligators? Would he hold me prisoner and torture me before killing me and then feeding me to the alligators? Or would he just kill me immediately and then feed me to the alligators? For some reason, every scenario in my mind involved those damn alligators. I don't want to go into the swamp with you. No, I said as firmly as my overwhelming fear would allow for. As I'm here telling this today, it goes without saying that I didn't end up as gator bait. He didn't take me forcefully into the swamps. He didn't do anything to me physically. Psychologically though, his terrifying comments were torture as the bridge just seemed to go on and on for what seemed like forever. When we finally reached the other side and he let me out, I thanked him for the ride as politely as I could manage. Once he pulled away, I could have fallen down and kissed the ground. I was safe. I wasn't dead. My journey continued for several more days until I ultimately ended up in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. There was another incident before I got there when I was picked up in Walker, Louisiana by a man who wasn't so much creepy as he was potentially dangerous. But by the time I ran into him, I was physically exhausted and dirty and hadn't had decent rest in days. When he and his wife offered to let me stay in their guest room for the night, I was so grateful to not have to sleep in the woods or in a ditch along the side of the road or in the back booth of some diner that I took him up on it. Desperation and exhaustion can certainly cloud a person's thinking. As we pulled away, he said in a genuinely friendly tone that I was welcome at his home and that he wasn't dangerous. I truly believed him until he pulled out a gun from between the seats and warned me that I'd better not be dangerous either. Oh boy. Why did I still go with him? Exhaustion and desperation, like I said. So I'm in the guest room of this trailer, in a comfortable bed for the first time in what I'm pretty sure was a couple of weeks. I'm relaxing there when his sister comes over. I don't see them being in a bedroom, but I hear them in the living room. She's talking through thoughts about wanting to unalive herself, wanting to die, and that's all she keeps talking about. Wanting to die and wanting to be the hand that extinguishes her own life. Finally, I hear the man get fed up and snap back. You want to die? You want to die? He screams. Then I hear the unmistakable pop of a gunshot. Oh my God. There are several seconds there where I'm again terrified for what's about to happen to me. This man just shot his sister, and I'm here in the house with them, potential witness. I look up at the window, wondering if I could possibly fit through it to escape, but I cannot. Then I hear her speak up. You just shot a hole in the ceiling. So apparently, he hadn't shot his sister. He was just a trigger-happy lunatic who had shot around into the ceiling to emphasize his frustration. To be fair, aside from this, they were actually very nice people. After the commotion, I ended up staying overnight anyway. Call me stupid if you like, but I was that tired. His wife took me back to the interstate in the morning. We had a nice conversation along the way. Although I would never stay there again. Ever. One star rating. But my hosts were very polite. When I got to Bay St. Louis, I ended up getting picked up by a lady who lived in Mobile, Alabama, who ended up taking me in, and I see her as my foster mother to this day. I absolutely love her to death. This horrific trip ended with me finding a new life, and a new family. So, there's a silver lining to every dark cloud, I suppose. Her husband, who I see as my foster father, has never stopped giving me grief about any of this. In the 20 years... He's never tired of it either. He especially liked to rip on Jimmy Buffett, an artist he personally despises, and he refers to him as Jimmy Buttplug. Did I learn anything from this? Well, if you're asking if I learned not to hitchhike, no. I went on several more journeys over the years before I finally decided that I'd had enough 
mm, adventure. Someone will surely think I'm stupid for this. Young people tend to be stupid, so there's no argument here. If you need any further proof of this, just watch MTV's coverage of Spring Break from the 1990s sometime. Watch how dumb all those young people act as they party on the beach. As a word of advice to those who might be considering hitchhiking, just don't. You can meet a lot of really interesting people. You can have a lot of positive experiences. But you could also end up getting picked up by a maniac. And you just might not be as lucky as I was. When I was pregnant with my first child who was born back in 2013, I joined an online birth club community for moms who were due the same month. Eventually, this led to a smaller Facebook group which allowed for more personal conversations. As you can imagine, being in a group of people whose only common connection is when your kid is born can lead to coming across some very interesting characters who you would have probably never interacted with otherwise. Anyway, over time, bonds were formed and moms shared a lot of their daily life, whether it was about the kids or otherwise. Among this group was a woman named Leslie. Almost a year after our February 2013 babies were born, she announced another pregnancy and that she was due in June of 2014. Of course, everyone congratulated her and were looking forward to new updates. Leslie mostly posted about her everyday life with her twins, annoyances on living with her sister-in-law, feeling stuck, how she and her family were really struggling for money and how she couldn't wait to be able to move into their own place. These posts about their financial issues got more and more detailed and frequent, and some very kind people from the group sent baby supplies to try to help out a struggling mom. With her due date approaching less than a month away, another mom posted and tagged her to check on her and ask how everything was going since Leslie had seemed to completely stop posting and commenting in the group. Not hearing anything back, someone got the bright idea to Google her name, Leslie Viatoro, and that's when a news story popped up. About three weeks prior to this post, Leslie was arrested for her connection to her boyfriend's attempted murder of a woman in their town. This sent the entire group down a rabbit hole of Facebook investigation and trying to piece together the story until all the details came out and Leslie's trial started. Leslie's side is that she was dropping her boyfriend Chad Horn off to a friend's house and was waiting in a nearby park to pick him up when he was done there, that she had no knowledge of what he was actually doing inside. She had her twin one-year-old daughters and nephew in her car with her, and obviously nine months pregnant at that time. The real story is that she was his getaway driver, that Chad had been hired as a hitman to kill the woman that he was dropped off to. Leslie had purchased supplies that Chad took with him to use in the attack, which were what ultimately led her to a guilty verdict in being complicit with the crimes. Chad forced his way into the home at gunpoint while this woman and her two children were home. He made her go out and start her vehicle while he stayed inside with her kids. And when she came back, he bound her hands with zip ties, slit her throat, and fired a single shot at her, which he missed before fleeing the woman's home in her Chevy Tahoe. The woman survived all of this and was able to get to her neighbor's house for help. Chad called 911 twice to try to report two made-up shootings at different locations in an attempt to lead the authorities away. There was ultimately a police chase with Chad crashing the stolen car before taking the easy way out. Over time, it was learned that there was a suspect who may have hired Chad for the hit on this woman, but no evidence has been found on him, even after dozens of search warrants have been issued. After much Facebook stalking from the group at the time of this trial, we suspected that it may have been this woman's ex-husband. Just speculation though, as none of it has ever been confirmed. She was married to a woman at the time of this hit, and I'm assuming her children were from a previous marriage. Again, all speculation, but this seems to be the likely answer for me. There was a lot of doubt surrounding Leslie's trial. Some jurors that gave a guilty verdict came out later and said that they regretted it 
and they wish they could change it. That she shouldn't be held accountable for Chad's crimes and intentions. I personally believe that without a doubt, Leslie knew what Chad intended to do. I think their sole motive was money, with all of Leslie's posts in the group about their financial struggles, and she was growing more and more desperate to get out of the sister's house, because nobody was happy there. Whether or not she knew the details of this family, or would have agreed to help, knowing that the woman's young kids were also home, who knows? But I do believe she knew that her role was to be the getaway driver for Chad. Leslie was found guilty in 2015 for her part in the attempted murder, burglary, kidnapping, and sentenced to 43 years in prison. Safe to say that by the time she gets out, she will no longer be welcomed in that Facebook group. 